George Osborne defended his job as editor of the Evening Standard in the House of Commons today, suggesting Parliament would be enhanced by his appointment. The former Chancellor has been criticised for taking on the role, particularly as he intends to continue as MP for his Cheshire constituency. He surprised fellow MPs this afternoon by turning up at a debate about his decision. Our political correspondent Simon Harris was watching. Opposition MPs think he should hang his head in shame. But today, George Osborne defiantly took his place in Parliament for an emergency debate all about him and his new job. To hold several time-consuming outside commitments that have a deep overlap with the political role of what is supposed to be a full-time commitment as a member of this House is impossible to defend. George Osborne. The new editor of London's Evening Standard was determined to take part in the debate. In my view, this parliament is enhanced when we have people of different experience take part in our robust debate yeah, yeah, yeah. and when people who have held senior ministerial office continue to contribute to the decisions we have to make. Readers will have to wait until May to see how Mr Osborne changes their paper. Today's edition put a positive spin on Sadiq Khan's plan for policing but a former Labour mayor thinks it unlikely Mr Khan will be treated quite so favourably by a Tory editor. Osborne's not going to be promoting Sadiq because also people see Sadiq as a future potential Labour leader and Prime Minister, so he'll see him as someone he needs to undermine. Clearly I'd have liked the new editor to be of a Labour bias, dare I say a, a Labour politician, but he's not, and I'll work with whoever the editor is. Many of the standards experienced journalists cut their teeth on local papers like the South London Press. But Mr Osborne has bypassed the traditional route, going straight from novice to editor in one giant leap. I think he's going to find working in newspapers very tough. I mean, Evening Standard's a wonderful newspaper um, and it's a fantastic team, very experienced people. And I think one of the big challenges he's going to face now is getting that team on side, particularly as someone who has no journalistic experience. Not to mention the small matter of divided loyalties, speaking up for his constituents in the north or being the voice of Londoners in the South. And let's talk about those dividing loyalties, because they could become apparent quite quickly, couldn't they? Yeah, there's a lot, lot of anger on the opposition benches that uh, he now has six jobs and still thinks he can be an effective constituency MP. He tried to diffuse that today with a joke saying today's debate in Parliament had come too late for the evening standard deadline. But MPs have serious questions, not least, has he broken parliamentary rules by announcing his new job before it's been cleared by an independent committee, process which applies to all ex-ministers, and then there's that conflict of interest. Mr Osborne is an MP for the North at a time when ministers uh, uh, thinking, uh, are thought to be going cold on Crossrail 2, there are fears in London that he will not stand up up for Crossrail 2 as editor of the paper because we'll be banging the drum for the so-called Northern Powerhouse. OK, Simon, thanks very much. Two years ago, Lutfer Rahman was removed from office as mayor of Tower Hamlets for corrupt and illegal practices. A police investigation followed, but no one was ever prosecuted. Well, that hasn't gone down well with Sadiq Khan's team at City Hall, who today ordered the police watchdog to look into that investigation. Here's our political correspondent, Simon Harris. There has been no intimidation, there has been no fraud. There's nothing brought into Hamlets. We have fantastic borough. But there was something rotten in Tower Hamlets and Lutfer Rahman knew it. When he was re-elected as the all-powerful mayor of this East London borough in 2014, it was after one of the most crooked elections in local government. For five years, Lutfer Rahman had an iron grip on this part of the East End. But in 2015, he was finally thrown out by a special election court. The evidence against him was damning. Muslim voters were told it was un-Islamic to support another candidate. Bangladeshi groups were bribed with council grants and a rival candidate was smeared as a racist. The court concluded the election was tarnished by corrupt and illegal practices. Yet despite a substantial police investigation, no one has ever been prosecuted. Now London's Deputy Mayor for Policing has asked Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary to examine the police investigation, saying the public need to have the highest level of confidence that any and all criminal prosecutions have been considered and pursued. Labour's candidate in 2014, John Biggs, eventually took control of Tower Hamlets when the election was rerun after Rahman was ejected. There were all sorts of suggestions of improper acts, but it seems, it seems that the investigation was only cursory. 
Do you think the Met failed? I think that they have failed to maintain public confidence because, uh, because there is still a, an unresolved, unfinished piece of business. Rahman was banned from standing in future elections and later declared himself bankrupt. Last week, the London Assembly accused Scotland Yard of major failings. They were very concerned that uh, perhaps action taken by police might be seen as being uh, perhaps racially motivated. But given what happened at the election court, which manifestly was totally and completely objective, I cannot understand why the police, if you like, were so cautious about this one. Tonight, the voters whose campaign uncovered the scandal at Tower Hamlets were hoping the police investigation into the reign of look for Rahman would now be reopened. Simon Harris, ITV News. Good evening. More news on unfolding events today as the heart of our capital came under attack. A police officer has been stabbed and killed in the grounds of the Houses of Parliament. A woman is dead and at least 10 others are seriously injured after a car hit people on Westminster Bridge. Scotland Yard described it as a terrorist incident. The attacker was shot dead by armed police. With the latest, here's Simon Harris. 40 minutes after the attack, victims were still being treated where they lay in the street. The 4x4 was on the pavement just beneath Big Ben. Its front smashed in after hitting the wall. Back along Westminster Bridge, a trail of injured pedestrians. All of them mown down as the 4x4 hurtled on its deadly journey towards Parliament. At least one person is thought to have been thrown into the river. And suddenly I heard a, a crunch of a metal against a curb. It was clearly it was the wheel of the car hitting the curb. I then, um, a colleague I was with said, Rob, get out of the way. I saw people being hit. I jumped from the pavement into the road. Um, you know, tragically, I could see people actually were passing me that had been hit. Um, and then I could just see the car continuing in that direction and they're just leaving devastation behind it. People were passing you... Uh, someone that was hit, certainly a gentleman, he was airborne, if he you like. He was flung into the yeah, air by, was, by was, the impact of... Yeah, and there was one lady, tragically, um, had gone under the bus. We were actually on the bridge. We heard gunshots, what we thought was gunshots, turned around and we saw the car ploughed into a lady, and she, I think it was a lady, I, well, I'm not 100% sure, but underneath the wheel, and you could hear screams. And then we heard gunshots again, and as we looked along the bridge, because we were only crawling along the bridge, there was bodies, literally. It must have been about 10, 10, but at 10 least bodies. 10, yeah, 12 bodies, shot, all in different just places. Just lying in different places along the bridge. Being shot, yeah. It must yeah. have been terrifying. It was horrendous, yeah. absolutely horrendous. So the, um, in the yard in front of Parliament, police officers could be seen running. One of their colleagues close to the gate had been stabbed. Other officers opened fire on the attacker. And I hear bang, bang, twice. This is my son, maybe car, his car. And I've been there. First, I cross the road because the car is stopped. I cross the road, I see a man like this. He's full of blood in his head. Armed police stood guard as paramedics then attempted to resuscitate the shot man. By now, ambulance crews were trying to save lives at multiple sites, in the grounds of Parliament, at the car and across the bridge. The south end of Westminster Bridge became a makeshift casualty clearing station with doctors triaging patients. In the Commons itself, MPs found themselves locked down and told not to move. There has been a serious incident within the estate. Uh, it seems that a police officer has been stabbed that uh, the alleged assailant uh, was uh, shot by armed police. Um, a, an air ambulance is currently attending the scene. As the security cordon was extended, Scotland Yard confirmed it was treating the attack as terrorism. We received a number of different reports, which included a person in the river, uh, a car in collision with pedestrians, and a man armed with a knife. Officers were already in that location as part of routine policing, uh, but immediately additional officers were sent uh, to the scene, and that included firearms officers. This part of London is a must on the tourist trail. Westminster, as usual, was packed with visitors, many of them filming on their mobile phones. 
Here, the moment when the shots rang out. But tonight, the tourists have gone. Parliament Square is a crime scene. At least two people are dead. One of them, a police officer doing his job, protecting MPs. Simon Harris, ITV News. Westminster Bridge behind me is open. The traffic has returned. A city is carrying on. But three minutes of horror yesterday has changed many lives. Three people were killed. The police officer who ran into danger. The mom on her way to pick her children up from school. And the American on holiday here with his wife. Tonight, some of those who survived are still critically ill, and police have named the man who brought terror to the capital 12 years after the July the 7th bombings. Simon Harris has the latest on the Westminster attack. Aisha Friday was on her way home from the sixth form college in Waterloo, where she worked. Her commute took her over Westminster Bridge. Kurt Cochrane was there to see the sights. The American was in London celebrating his silver wedding anniversary. PC Keith Palmer was doing his job, protecting MPs when he was stabbed just inside the gates of Parliament. As the names of the three victims emerged today, police finally confirmed the identity of their killer. Khalid Massoud was the 52-year-old terrorist who used a 4x4 to murder and maim innocent people before being shot by an armed police officer. What I can confirm is that the man was British-born and that some years ago he was once investigated by MI5 in relation to concerns about violent extremism. He was a peripheral figure. The case is historic. He was not part of the current intelligence picture. But MPs weren't here to talk about a terrorist. They returned to their seats in the Commons to remember a familiar face, the police officer who helped keep them safe. For one MP, former London Assembly member James Cleverley, the memories go back many years to when they were both young soldiers. He was a strong, professional public servant. And it was a delight to meet him here again only a few months after being elected. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, in recognition of the work that he did and the other police officers and public servants here in the House do, uh, consider recognising his gallantry and sacrifice formally with a posthumous uh, recognition? London was once again a city of sirens as the sound of police cars answering emergency calls reflected a new uneasiness after another terrorist outrage. It was also a city of flags at half-mast. But London got on with what it does, as it does every time. We're going to carry on being vigilant. We're never going to be complacent. That's one of the reasons why Londoners will see, visitors will see additional armed officers, additional unarmed officers over the next few days. The yard beneath Big Ben was still a crime scene where the search for clues was thorough. Police raided six addresses in London and the West Midlands and arrested seven people. They also allowed Westminster Bridge to reopen. 24 hours ago, the pavements were busy, buses and cars were making their way across the bridge. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Then suddenly, without warning, a 4x4 began mowing down pedestrians. The swift return to normality after such horrific carnage did not go unnoticed. I think people are very strong, like, you know, life carrying on as usual. I think that's important, but I think it's also important to take a moment to sort of come here and contemplate what happened. Like Theresa May said, we go on. We don't let them win. We can't let them win. You know, as frightened as we are, we've all got to watch what we're doing, but they're not going to win. At Scotland Yard, PC Palmer's colleagues paid their own tribute with a short ceremony. As his family issued a statement saying he was a friend to everyone who knew him. He will be deeply missed. We love him so much. Simon Harris, ITV News, Westminster.